Good afternoon. Welcome in to the Illini Enquirer podcast. It's Jeremy Warner, Derek Piper. We're about 12 hours later than normal on this uh, post-game podcast, but it was late up in Evanston. Joy Wagner and I had to get up early for a football media availability. Well, we talked with a, a lot of the transfers today, the offensive side of the ball. Uh, they don't know if football is added. But here we are, Derek Piper, to talk about a gut-wrenching loss, but one heck of a basketball game up at Evanston as Northwestern edges out Illinois 96-91 in overtime. I looked at you with about five minutes to two minutes left in this game, and I was like, this is awesome. Like just the haymakers these two teams were throwing. I, I know there's plenty of negative to talk about from Illinois and a missed opportunity, another quad one missed opportunity for this team. But uh, tip of the cap to Northwestern, I thought Illinois, despite not playing clean to have a chance in that game, uh, just made for phenomenal theater with a split crowd up at Welsh Ryan. It was an electric game. And, yeah, the atmosphere was really fun. You get the 50-50 split. Uh, I know we'll talk, obviously, about the student section reaction to Terrence Shannon. And it was pretty predictable uh, in terms of it being uh, vicious and vile and some of the stuff that they said to him. But uh, just a basketball game, that, especially offensively, two teams that – are really rolling. Illinois missed a lot of shots at the rim, of course, but when you score into the 90s in overtime, drama at the end, just the back and forth nature, like you're mentioning, down the stretch of traded punches of a, a quick 6 0 run by Northwestern, responded then by Illinois, and, and, and then just back and forth big shots. Terrence hits a big three late to tie the game, and then uh, Illinois has a lead, and Bowie drives them and pump fakes and scores it. And then Illinois obviously has the chance to win it with Damask. I thought. Uh, we can dive into that a little bit too, that I would have put the ball. I know we talked about it during the timeout, who are you going with? And I know Shannon is your best player, but just the way that he had kind of been struggling and not in rhythm, I thought that it was the right move to go to Damask. You get the switch on the buoy. He just doesn't make that, that mid range shot. So uh, go to overtime, have some defensive mistakes, which we're going to get into. Yep. And uh, boo boo, has a night, man. And, and that's what he's done in some clutch moments. And that's what they do to people at, at well, Shrine, I know a lot of fans probably don't really want to hear about it. I wrote about it in the preview that they're undefeated at home this year in the Big Ten. And since the start of last season, they're 4-0 against ranked opponents, beat number one Purdue twice, beat number 10 Illinois now, and also uh, a 14th ranked Indiana team last year. So it's a become a tough environment, and they play a lot better at home. And then, you know, they, they shot the lights out, which Illinois yeah. just – part of what Illinois was doing defensively, but also part of Northwestern just having a night. There are things we're going to get into to criticize and Illinois needs to learn from and to improve from. So to be disappointed is it's legit um, because you missed an opportunity. And Illinois is now, what, two, two and four in quad one opportunities. They have not gotten a lot of marquee wins so far this season. And you could have gone and done something if you would execute a little bit better defensively or offensively and gotten another huge win that kept you in the race for the Big Ten. Now, it's a long season ahead. Uh, so there is disappointment, but I don't think like I'm going to sound the alarms of, oh my gosh, the season is over after this, if that's how people want to feel. I just don't agree with it because Northwestern had to have an epic night to beat you when you didn't even play the best, uh, in, in my opinion. The, the way they shot at the rim, the way they played defensively, like I think Illinois is going to play better than this, and I thought they got Northwestern's best shot physically. Like They were a way more physical team than they were in Champaign a couple weeks ago. And listen, Boo Booey made some ridiculous runners. I think Illinois is going to take most of the time. Uh, and then some of those threes, step back threes. Like, yeah, Illinois let those guys feel good. Um, and, and that's probably the reason they made some of those shots. But um, some of those step back threes were, were big time shots. And I, I just tip my cap to Boo Booey. Uh, that's a no doubt first team All Big Ten guy. Uh, you and I were having the discussion is this the best player Northwestern's ever had? He's got the advantage of having five years. So he could be the all time winning scorer. You know, Evan Eschmeyer. Uh, Michael Thompson, Juice Thompson's up there. John Schoen is their all-time winning scorer, but Boo Boo is certainly their clutchest player. And at home, he is—he's ridiculous. Like, I, I, there's nobody I'd rather. Maybe him and Jameer Young. Is Jameer Young made the shot last night? I, I'm fearful if, if those guys got the ball with the game on the lines. Boo's a big-time player, and I know that he's gotten better through the years, a lot more efficient. But it's one of those I remember. When Trace comes to Champaign last year and dominated Illinois, it's like, man, Kofi was really good because <laughs> Kofi always got the better of that matchup. And then you see Boo do what he did last year at State Farm Center. And then this game, it's like Trent Frazier was really, really good on defense of, of making life hell for 
Boo Booey for all those and, years. And, so. and it makes me think, oh, Io, Illinois used to have one of these. They really don't have one of those point guards right now. Yeah, no doubt. So uh, you do tip your cap to Boo on, on a lot of those plays. Now, he was getting the switches that he wanted late, which I know Brad took ownership for. When you, you look at the post game, they went five-way switching, and they were really hunting out Luke Goody and Marcus Damask. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, he just flat out – beat Terrence Shannon in a crucial defensive possession last minute of the game, downhill, pump fake, Shannon goes in the air and he makes it. So, uh, and then the threes, yeah, he, he was able to to get hot and hit a big one. He got Goody on a switch and hit that step back, which seemed like a huge play. Illinois was starting to build a little momentum. And then that, I think, tied the game or, or pulled it close again. I mean, it was, I think you had the stat. It, was it ever out until overtime? Was it ever outside of like a five-point game? At- no, it was a two-possession game the entire way it just it was you're on edge the entire time but let, let's talk about the defensive issues for Illinois because this isn't just one game like this felt a lot like Maryland you know Purdue's a, a different animal but this did feel a lot like going up against a high level guard Jameer Young Boo Booey Illinois has really struggled uh to defend those guys but over the last six games according to Bart Torvik Illinois is number 111 in defensive efficiency just gave up 1.28 points per possession to Northwestern, despite what I thought were some some matchup advantages. You gave up 1.1 to Maryland, 1.22 to Purdue. This was by far their worst defensive performance. Again, tip of the cap to Northwestern for, for making some of these shots, but 55% from the field, 10 for 13 from three after halftime. Derek, there were busted switches. There were struggles to contain another great guard. I, I know you just watched uh, all Boo Booey's possessions again. What went so wrong for Illinois in defending these ball screens? A lot. A lot <laughs> went wrong. Uh, I was joking with you. I'd love to pull up the synergy, and maybe I can just do a little Mike Latulip action, try to emulate. Obviously, he's the goat at it, so I'm not going to try to uh, take his job there. Maybe, but... maybe next week I'll just let you do it with Latulip. You guys yeah, no. combine for that. I'm sure he'll have plenty to say, but I think that tale of two halves in terms of the way that Illinois defended it, they played a lot of drop coverage early against it, which I just felt like it, it's not a bad – decision to have Coleman essentially sitting and help defense. Uh, but that was really the thing. When Nicholson goes to screen him, Coleman was so far off. Like watch rewatching it, I, I noticed it and we were commenting about it during the game. He just seemed to be down by the Big Ten logo, if not just in front of the cylinder, when a guy is getting set a screen for and there's just so much open space there for Bowie to come off the screen and have a lot of free area. I know the analytics say, okay, that's a mid-range jump shot or a runner, which he loves to take. Uh, I will say that Bowie's just outstanding at, number one, making those runners, which sometimes they look really tough. But uh, Synergy says he's made more runners than anybody in the country this year. So I, that's kind of playing that's into – great strategy, yeah. It, it plays into kind of what he likes. And I think in general, while you can play the math game of uh, if, if he makes a bunch of those twos, even you know at a 50% clip, which is kind of in line with what he does on the, the floaters – you're probably going to win the math problem if you, Illinois, over one point possession. And I'm making this a math class, which I don't want to do. But uh, I, I just think him seeing openings, getting open shots plays into his his confidence and his rhythm offensively, which then later in the game, he's feeling himself a little bit because he's felt like he's gotten what he wants to get offensively. So I thought Coleman should have played farther up to be able to – because this is, a, this is a mobile defender. This is not – a lot of drop coverage guys are lumbering, slow-footed big men that need to be down near the paint because if they're out past the free throw line, they're going to be in trouble. Coleman, you're fine with playing him on an island against Bowie. Why not have him come up and, and show against him or cover to Nicholson? There were just times where there was so much space before Nicholson even got out of his role. I know times Illinois helps on the driver and they throw the lob to Nicholson a few times, which is a, a hard play to guard, but – uh, I just felt like Illinois gave him too much space off of those picks uh, in the first half and in the second half in particular down the stretch. They're running just little rub actions, which was very reminiscent of what Penn State did to you with, with Jalen Pickett to get the switches that they wanted. And Brad mentioned, and, and part of this was the problem they had last year with the five-way switching. Uh, also, I remember the Maryland game where they got Dante Scott on whoever they wanted because they just run a little rub. They're not even really screens a lot of the time. They're, they're – they're plays that if you really are determined not to get screened or to stay with Bowie or just to to make them actually force a switch, you might not actually have to play into the matchup that you want that that they want you to get into. So 
I thought Terrence on the ball uh, with Bowie could have really gotten into him and forced it to where he, you couldn't screen him. Uh, or also just like sometimes Bowie's at the logo. They come to run a little rub. Just go under it, and then you're, you're right where you're supposed to be. So uh, there are things that make that challenging if there is an actual screen because if you don't switch it, that's an angle for Bowie to go downhill. And then if you get caught up in it and the help defender, the guy for the screener, which they were – doing a good job of running like guard on guard screens, wing on guard screens, where if the help guy shows on Bowie, they slip that to a, to a three and they'll just kick that back to him for an open three. So uh, Illinois got put in a blender. I just think that some of the schematics they, they should have were well-intentioned, I think, but just not well executed. And part of that is preparation. You got to be able to wrap that in practice and, and be able to have communication on that. I thought Coleman should have been in a better position. Maybe part of that's on him. Part of that's on the coaching staff of telling him where to be. So, uh, but Bowie toasted them, and they did some other stuff off the ball that was good too. Yeah, I thought uh, Chris Collins won the chess match. Chess match against uh, Brad Underwood yesterday. Uh, Matthew Nicholson was a non-factor against Illinois, but Illinois just bullied Preston and Luke Hunger, who didn't even play in this game yesterday. They bullied those guys, uh, and Illinois won the glass again today. But th those dump offs to Nicholson and, and the. You know, when Boo Booey didn't have a runner, he had a lob uh, to Nicholson for, for a dunk. So I just thought the communication was poor. Maybe that's being on the road. Maybe that's Shannon just coming back. Um, and we, we'll get into Shannon. I, I do think last night impacted him, uh, of being on the road and hearing what he heard. But you know, Ty Rogers wasn't communicating. It felt like Coleman wasn't heard as, as normally as he is. So those busted switches. But the one thing I'm thinking of, Derek, and maybe I'll ask two up this next time is, you mentioned missing Trent Frazier. Trent Slight is quick. He he can chase people and get over screens and, and do all those things. Ty Rogers is a lot of body. And it just looks like he's struggling to navigate and, and take the right angles on fighting through all these screens. And Terrence is a big body. He's easier to screen. Like, yeah, you got to take that physicality from him. But they're struggling to do that. And I just don't think Justin Harmon's a strong defender. We know Damask and, and Luke Goody are going to get beat off the dribble by a guy like Luke Goody. And th the switching, Brad Underwood owned it uh, after the game. Like it was a bad decision. It was a bad decision to go to all that switching because, uh, like, obviously they got cooked uh, when Boo Booey got on somebody really other than Hawkins. Uh, you know, Shannon got beat a lot of times, but I thought he was fighting through some of that stuff a little bit better. But it just was a, a bad matchup, and Illinois had no answer uh, for it. But I, I've just noticed that those guys are struggling to get through screens. I, I don't know if it's their size, it's their wearing down, it's too many minutes for a team that, you know, Ty Rogers played five minutes in the second half. That didn't make a lot of sense uh, to me. So uh, what do you, what do you think of that? Just because those guys are noticeably struggling to get through these things that we we noticed Trent Frazier, and he, hate to throw it out there, Andre Curbelo could get through some of those things too. Yeah, and even last year, I thought Sincere Harris did a good job of being of refusing to be screened. Yeah, Fedigator just said, this is the game where we missed Sincere's defense on Bowie. Yeah. Sincere changed right. games last year in, in that role. Last year on Bowie, uh, of getting through those, Texas, when they're trying to create advantages and angles for Marcus Carr, uh, even though Illinois was in switch everything a lot of times, or switch one through four, Sincere just stuck to him. Just like, I'm just not going to give up my assignment here. So I, I think some of that is, is Illinois having to learn how to be selective. Even if they're in the switch, everything base, it's part of the, the, the layers to it. The communication is very important because it, it, that's where if you're trying to on the fly say, okay, this is actually a time where we're not going to switch. That has to be well communicated. You're going to have a lot of bus uh, in that as well. So uh, I do give credit to Chris Collins for running stuff that that created those advantages. And similar to Illinois, when they get the the booty ball matchups and when they run some some actions with screens and and whatnot to to get their matchups that they want, it's very similar to what Northwestern was able to do. And and that's just that it's kind of like the the NBA game trickling down to the college right. game because there's a lot of that. There's a lot of like little rubs that then okay, LeBron's on a small and then they're gonna they're gonna ISO that so. Uh, Northwestern was doing that pretty well. Uh, I think it does maybe send some uh, alarm bells a little bit. Like Illinois defensively to that point, like here recently, they have some guys in particular that if you get Goody on switches, if you get Damask on switches, those are problems. Um, those are problems for Illinois, and those guys aren't the quickest. While they have size, they're just not uh, 
very nimble footed, that explosive, uh, those kind of things. So uh, those are things to look at. I, I think just varying up your coverages too to keep people off balance is something that they're going to have to look at. To, yeah, you know, there was one point they came out in like this two, three zone look and Chris Collins called a timeout. And I'm like, maybe just one play. Like, yeah. Well, two up texted me and goes, I think they just ran a box in one, <laughs> like on one play. And I'm like, just switching it up. It just felt like, uh, you know, Brad Underwood made a switch to the switching, uh, but just kind of keeping teams off guard a little bit. Uh, I don't know if they're going to go full court pressure or anything like that, but just to, to get them off their rhythm because Northwestern never fell out of rhythm in that second half. Definitely not. No, and maybe to trap Bowie off a screen at one point, make him give it up. I know if you're having a, a, a guard come in, if it's Langborg or if it's Barry screening for him, you don't want to maybe trap that because then that guy's open. But especially when Nicholson was setting those screens, Illinois had a real chance. To, it goes back to, not to bring up, Illinois fans are already in a bad mood about last night, but anytime you mention Loyola, like the way that they guarded Io, anytime that they set a Kofi on – io screen it was a double team because loyola says all right throw it to kofi at the three-point line or the free throw line a guy that doesn't dribble a guy that doesn't shoot uh otherwise we got your guy 30 feet 25 to 30 feet from the basket in a trap so uh, i think illinois could have done that more with coleman last night pressing up on buoy daring buoy to throw it to nicholson and then you have time to recover instead they sat and drop and let buoy get those floaters that he want that he likes to take that were open. And then of course he makes some tough ones later in the game. So uh, learning lessons to take from this game, Northwestern, like you said earlier, had to play a really efficient and just a very, very good game offensively to win that. But they did. And a lot of it on the switching note too, like busting them and, and giving up open threes or, or layups on, on cuts that does play into to what Collins is running, but also Illinois communication, which needs to be better. I also want to give a shout out to a guy who's, who's becoming kind of a, a Big Ten star, Brooks Barnheiser. He's, good. He's a heck of a player. He, he can do the booty ball. He can do the, th the three point shot really well. Like 19 points per game over his last six. I think he's averaging 14, 15 for the season. Like Boo Booey having that guy along with Ty Berry, who had that one stretch, and that was about it. Uh, but I think that makes them, they're not as good of a defensive team as last year by far without Audige, but they're a way better offensive team. And that's a NCAA tournament team. So it's not it's not like a bad loss, but it's a missed opportunity for Illinois. But Barnheiser's playing himself into all Big Ten consideration. He's one of the most underrated players in the Big Ten, probably getting a lot more recognition of late here. You look at in Big Ten play, coming into last night, he was averaging 15-plus a game and, and obviously was able to elevate that as well. He's got some damask to him, like the mid-post, back down smaller guys, ability to hit – in particular, he's really good 15 feet and in, like those pull-up jump shots, and then can knock down a, a three or two. And just a guy that will mix it up on the glass, will make a lot of really hard-nosed, gritty plays for you as well. And, yeah, offensively, the way the Barry shot it, Langborg's been great at Evanston, especially from three. He's like a 50% three-point shooter from December 1st and on uh, in that building. So they can, they can really hurt you offensively surrounding that with Bowie. It's just – not having Audis defensively is hurting them, but um, them getting that quad one win last night moves them away from the bubble. Of yeah. course, if Illinois would have beat them, uh, they've got a rematch coming up with Purdue. If they would have lost both those games, they'd kind of be in a similar position where they're in that range, not on the wrong side of it, but still had work to do to, for the tournament. Uh, beating Purdue and Illinois on their home floor can eliminate and even swing the scales back in their favor in contrast to that Chicago State loss, which obviously is pretty ugly. Who do you like more, Northwestern or Michigan State? Man. Uh, that, that's, I still think Illinois finishes with a better record than Northwestern. Yeah, I do think their defense will bounce back here, and I think Terrence will get better. We'll talk about Terrence here in a second, but uh, I would still have – Illinois up there. I mean, we got to start talking about Maryland probably at some point in, in the top half of the Big Ten again. But um, I, I mean, Northwestern right now is, is tied with Illinois for third in the Big Ten here. Yeah. And uh, I know the game was in Evanston, but they they smacked Michigan State in that game. And that, they are actually, as far as I was looking at their their offensive performances, as good as Northwestern was last night in terms of analytics, points per possession, they were even better when they beat they put 88 on Michigan State in regulation uh, and beating them by like 15. So uh, I might lean Northwestern, but I still – yeah, I'd probably lean Northwestern actually. Yeah, I, I think Boo Booey and Tyson Walker cancel each other out. 
two all Big Ten first team guys probably. And that, but like, I think I can count on what Northwestern has as supporting cast better than what Michigan State has as supporting cast, especially Barnheiser. Bar- I Barnheiser. take Barnheiser over Malik Hall and your For guy. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Uh, all right. I want to get to Shannon, but finishing at the rim. I looked this up. Hoop Math has Illinois 42nd in the country at field goal percentage at the rim. So this has not been a huge issue all season, of course. And we'll see during Big Ten play how, how that moves. But two out of the last three games, it has been an issue. Now, last game before this one, they were, what, 26 out of 30 or something like that at the rim. But 16 of 38 at the rim uh, against Northwestern. A lot of these contested put-back attempts, all those kind of things. But – 42% at the rim is is awful. They're more of a 68% at the rim team. And, of course, this follows Maryland, where they're 9 for 23. So what do you attribute this to, Derek? It's hard to find an answer to that. I asked Brad about it. I asked Quincy and Marcus, and, and they said that, you know, the obvious is you just got to make them. You got to be able to make them at a higher rate. You understand not all of them are going to go in when they're contested and it's physical and I do think that plays to Northwestern playing a more physical brand of basketball last night uh, of just being tougher to score through. They're more, they're challenging more even on second chance opportunities. Illinois killed them on the offensive glass and second chance points were a big reason why that game Illinois was in the lead at times. And then it goes to overtime, but uh, yeah, I mean, these are older players, guys like Quincy, uh, even Coleman around the basket. Marcus has got to finish a little bit at a higher rate. Ty has struggled at that. That's one guy that, Maybe consistently you can say has been a trend where he's left more to be desired finishing around the basket. But uh, I, I think that one of the, the remedies is getting Terrence there more. Terrence yeah. only took three shots at the rim of the 36. Of course, he gets fouled a lot of times when he goes downhill. But having him getting to the basket at a higher clip is someone that obviously is, is able to make those at a high rate. So uh, we'll see if it progresses into a further prolonged issue. Maryland is is a, an older physical team that's good defensively, so it kind of makes sense that things were tough around the basket in that game. And then sometimes you're just going to have where it's not your night. Last night, I thought, you know, the defensively, Northwestern's been pretty poor. They're dead last in the Big Ten in defensive efficiency and league play. So you should have, and you still did, had a pretty good night offensively. But uh, it, it didn't profile as a game that should have been tough to finish around the basket. Illinois just missed some, maybe rushed some at the rim. But big picture, I think you just – you trust that you got to be able to just phys- finish through contact, be physical and strong, and and then also, also like I said, get Terrence there. Yeah, Gary A has some games, and one of them was last night where he just tries to maybe a little too fancy around the rim when he's got all that power. Uh, Ty Rogers, 56% at the rim. That's lower than last year. He's 59%. He's the main guy I feel needs to, to get back to that. Um, but let's get into the, the Terrence Shannon conversation. We knew, Derek um, – first game on the road would be pretty difficult. And I was hanging around the student section about an hour before the game and the security was trying to say, be respectful, be respectful, but you knew it was going to happen here. Guilty. No means no. Um, a lot of, a lot of difficult things. Like I, I'm not going to like throw darts at Northwestern because Illinois did the same thing to Pierre Pierce 20 years ago. Um, this is what you're going to have uh, on the road. And I, I do think it affected him. How can it not? You're human and you're hearing these things uh, as you're going through it. And that that's going to be the case. I mean, he wanted to play. He knew this was what he was going to come back into. Uh, but Terrence Shannon, two for seven uh, during regulation, five turnovers during the game. Uh, and defensively, he obviously struggled. So what would you make of, of that experience for Terrence? It was predictably tough. And just the fact of the basketball part of him – not fully being in a rhythm still makes sense. Like I, he didn't shoot the ball well. And and until the second half, particularly against Rutgers outside of some lobs to Coleman there early, uh, looked like a guy that had been off for three weeks. And you think just not only the games that he missed, he wasn't around the team. He wasn't practicing. He's shooting with managers and lifting with Fletch. That doesn't play into the the rhythm that you have playing within an offense Uh, defensively uh, to be rusty there too. I think just with, assignments, rotations, communication, and whatnot, uh, and the intensity that it takes to compete at the defensive end, too. So uh, a lot still to be desired from Terrence in in comparison to who he was prior as a dominant, well on his way to being a first-team All-American. I think that offensively he's still 
forcing the issue at times. He, he's, it's kind of a balance where he didn't get to the rim a whole lot. And when he tried, he got the ball ripped a few times. Of course, he uh, going to the basket and, and trying for big dunks. One, he just, I guess, got stuffed by the rim. I don't know if a lot of fans were claiming foul a lot last night. I know it. Um, I don't know if he got fouled on that or not. Another one was actually a foul that he uh, then wasn't able to finish at the basket. But uh, And the three ball, he's one for 10 from three since returning. This was a guy that was 41% yep. from deep prior to his suspension. So uh, him just trying to get back into a rhythm with his jump shot, uh, finding ways to get him to the basket downhill. Uh, at times he's hesitant, it seems, and, and then other times just kind of maybe forcing it. And then defensively he's got to be better. And part of that I think maybe is just – focus and, and just getting back into the the groove of it but uh, the communication stuff where they had the very wide open three where Ty and, and Terrence both follow the, the cut by Bowie uh, that was I don't know whose responsibility who was at fault there but those were the two guys involved with it but uh, and then with the the reaction it's not no surprise at all and I'm with you like can we say that Northwestern took it too far the the students I mean some of that stuff you wouldn't want anyone to say maybe to his face, uh, obviously, uh, and they would probably be hesitant to do so, but uh, they're not going to be the only ones. And so just because they were the first doesn't mean that they're unique in that. It's just the, the nature of what it's going to be like. And um, I, I would, he's a human who's going through a very sensitive and emotional time. And we obviously don't know all the details of uh, what actually happened or, or what's going to happen in the criminal case. But in the meantime, it's got to be something that you obviously hear and that, uh, draw some kind of emotional reaction out of you and your teammates. And as I said with Joey yesterday, I don't know if we're going to be able to talk to him until there's a locker open locker room in the postseason because uh, his lawyers have told him to say nothing. So I just I, I don't know if we're going we're going to hear from him ab about all of this at some point. Certainly not going to talk about the criminal case going on, but even the basketball side of it would would be very interesting. But I think we expected some rustiness. It's, it's just like any player coming off an injury or, or, or anything like that. Um, you're going to need some time to adjust. The team's going to need time to adjust around him. Uh, and maybe you have to take a loss for it now, Derek. But in the long run, they're better with Terrence Shannon on the court. And, and now it's about how does he learn from this experience on the road? How does he learn from you know the last two games of kind of working his way? The first half against Rutgers wasn't all that great. But the second half, you saw Terrence Shannon kind of coming alive again. Uh, so he needs to use that. The team needs to use that get some practices in here before Indiana because uh, they need him. Uh, they need him to be an elite team, but it's not a surprise uh, that right away uh, they're not quite yet. Uh, one one thing I, I thought was interesting was Ty Rogers only playing five minutes in the second half in overtime. I know he wasn't clean last night. He, he was part of some defensive switches. As I said, he was struggling to get through screens, but man, Justin Harmon had a rough night. I, I know he made the, the go ahead runner, with uh, about 36 seconds left, but that was really the only positive I thought he had most of the night. Uh, I was just shocked that the Ty Rogers never got some action just to maybe initiate some offense because at least he was aggressive, uh, sometimes over aggressive going against Matthew Nicholson uh, right. in the post, but I at least liked that he was trying to create some things offensively. And then at least he's a better defender than Justin Harmon, even if he's maybe not a lockdown defender quite yet. Yeah, and it's going to be something that I think that Brad's going to have to obviously evaluate as you go forward because Terrence slotting back in is a 30-minute-a-game type of guy. And Ty played 14 minutes, I believe, against Rutgers. And, and last night, like you said, not much there in the second half. So uh, defensively, you outside of like I think it's very fair to point out and it's noticeable that him getting screened is something that he's got to be able to yep. navigate a little bit better. But he's – in terms of an individual defender, a plus at that side uh, for the most part on the season. Yeah. Uh, offensively, I get the understanding or just the the logic behind if Nicholson is guarding Ty, he's planted in the lane a whole lot. Yes, you can attack him, but it, it didn't play to Ty's advantage a whole lot after kind of Nicholson settled in there and, and didn't bite on any pump fakes or kind of fakes left or right, just kind of wall up against him, and that, that's tough. And then uh, so make – by having Ty out, you kind of force Nicholson on somebody else. And a lot of times they had him on Quincy, which gave Quincy some open threes. So I, I understand the the logic of, of that sense. But uh, would you have wanted – I know Goody made threes, but if you had Ty in instead of Goody, uh, 
then maybe it's harder to, to hunt that matchup defensively. I know that they would probably still then target Marcus and Mass. So um, yeah. I understand the the kind of the dichotomy or whatever you want to call it, the decision there uh, between what Ty brings positively and what maybe he can be exploited with. But it was interesting that he didn't play a whole lot. And, and yes, Harmon in particular, who does provide some spacing, you do at least have to acknowledge that he could shoot that three and, and make some, but uh, very little impact last night. I mean, they ended up taking 25 threes, but man, it felt like they passed up about 10 open ones, right? Like, yeah. so hesitant. Mass early in particular. Yeah. And then just got hesitant with it uh, where the windows would close. They pump faked and, and didn't take it. Yeah, Gary A had a couple. Harmon had a couple. It just felt like, man. Uh, and they shot 11 for 25, made 11 threes. Uh, still ended up losing this game. We'll get to some of the uh, questions here, comments on uh, the live YouTube here. Uh, but the Indiana game, uh, Hoosiers have lost three straight on the road, Derek, three or four overall. But They've had a week to prepare for Illinois. It's a quick turnaround for the Illini. Uh, as you know, the Hoosiers, great talent in the front court, um, but the back court has a lot of issues, a roster construction issue for Mike Woodson. But this becomes a, a big game. you got to protect home court. If you want to stay in the Big Ten race, you certainly got to protect home court and then find a way to, to get a few more road wins. But what do you think of this matchup against the Hoosiers, who won all three, but, of course, Trace Jackson Davis no longer uh, in the crimson and cream. Big game. Indiana trying to put together a, a tournament resume here. They're going to need some big ones, especially probably away from home to get the quad ones. And uh, we'll be interesting to see if Khalil Ware is a go. I, I haven't followed up in, in terms of seeing any reports on that. Uh, Jeff Rabjohns texted me their report. They expect him to go. Okay. Big so one. What, guys. One of the better draft prospects in the uh, Big Ten. Yeah. He's played well this year. I know he was. he had a knee brace on in the Wisconsin game when he didn't play. So as far as his how 100% he is, uh, that will be interesting. But a guy that's really long, good athlete, uh, can contest stuff around the rim, and then just they can throw it in there, and it, it's tough to stop him fin finishing-wise. He's not all that strong and, and physical by any means, but uh, will be something that Illinois will have to, to try to battle against with Coleman and then uh, Malik Renews having a heck of a year. So mm -hmm. I think it's a, a good matchup between him and Quincy Garrier uh, for the most part that's going to be – uh, you know, when you look at that three through five spot for what Illinois has and and on Indiana side, you can throw in Mbako, uh with, you know, Damask. They, they got physicality and they got some positional size in that sense, but it's the Trey guard Galloway play. Too. Yeah. yeah, Galloway's got some size to him too. Uh, the guard play has, has really lacked. Um, Xavier Johnson struggled. I know he's been injured some. But uh, on Illinois side, this would be – if you don't hold down home court – to my knowledge, this is probably another quad three loss. If you were to, to take it on your home court, I have to double check that. But definitely uh, one you don't want to want to take. And beyond just the the Big Ten race, which you pretty much probably – would it be too early to say you get put out of it? You'd be three games out uh, if you lose. But starting to think about seeding. You you don't want to fall down to where – you recently you've been in that three or four seed range for the NCAA tournament. Yes, a lot of time still left. But uh, some losses on your home floor, particularly to teams that aren't – quad one games can really hurt your seed line. And uh, you want to be able to be up for this one. It is a quick turnaround. So um, not a lot of time to maybe rep it on the practice court in terms of reacclimating Terrence and everything. But I think the game reps, it's going to click for him at some point. Um, yeah. This would be a big one against a, a rival. I know Indiana doesn't like to say it's a rivalry, but uh, we do around here. Yeah. Cubs fan says, I'm fine with the decision to go to Damask at the end, uh, but they didn't get him to the spot, which would be closer to the baseline where he operates most effectively. Free throw line isn't his spot. Yeah, usually when he goes to that baseline, you got Gary A for the cross court pass. You could have you know, Goody or somebody uh, that he could outlet it to as well. Uh, what would you make of that, Derek? Getting in the middle of four doesn't surprise me because you, you get some options from there. Uh, I just didn't think he got a great look. Like in uh, Boo Boo, he got under him a little bit, but. I just didn't think he got a clean look. Maybe could have started the action a little sooner. Yeah. Letting him kind of booty ball booey a little bit more uh, with more time on the clock to maybe get to the spot that he wants to get. I understand maybe coming up to the top of the key because they ran a little rub with Terrence to get that switch because Bowie was originally on TJ. He comes across and then they switch that uh, into Damascus getting that. So maybe if you're in the on the wing or in, that might be something that's – maybe harder to, to get, not saying you couldn't, but uh, with the open open space at the top of the key, that's usually a an auto switch and and then him getting to his spot. I mean, you'll, you'll live with the shot. You can take a lot worse shots 
or just spots on the floor yeah. uh, than what you ended up with. But I, I get maybe wanting him on a, a mid post into the wing side uh, kick out, but they didn't allow him to kind of read the floor. There wasn't enough time for him to force a double or anything like that. It was kind of, yeah. once you get the switch, you got to go and make a play and maybe you could have went a little earlier. I mean, they got the matchup they wanted. Um, yeah, so, so maybe like, maybe you could have passed to Terrence who's on the wing for a three, something like that. But uh, you got the matchup you wanted. Just, just didn't execute at the end of the day. Um, Chris, Brad needs an assistant that can help him with tactics and in-game adjustments. Chris, I can promise you he has that. Uh, and, and Derek, we learned the offensive and defensive coordinators are, right? He hasn't said it officially, but that Tyler Underwood offensively is uh, very involved in the game planning, calling up plays or whatever they their decisions in terms of what they're going to run offensively. Zach Hamer on the defensive side. Uh, so as he's, he's referenced in the past, they've had offensive defensive coordinators. They still rotate the scouts among yeah. the assistant coaches in terms of who has a scout on a particular opponent. But those guys are solely focused on those sides of the ball. So, uh, and, and they're seated, they're, they're seated, I should say, seated right. is not a word, uh, right next to, to Brad Underwood, left and right at him. So um, very involved in, in that. And um, yeah, I mean, they made an adjustment last night. I mean, they changed how they guarded the screens. It's just the execution of it. And then you can argue whether you want about, should they have gone five way switching? I just think the switching dynamic was fine. It was just that you were auto switching, that you didn't have any selectivity to it. You didn't actually make them force you into a switch. You were just like, oh, Langborg's going to jog right past your face. So then all of a sudden, Goody should guard Boo Boo. Like that, that shouldn't have happened. Yeah. Um, Bren says, I love Brad overall, but too often it seems like if he gets to the game, the other coach has a better game plan. He just rolls with it and effectively accepts defeat. I don't think I don't think that's the truth, but um, I don't think Brad's accepting defeat. I mean, we've gotten to know Underwood. Say yeah, Dominic. No, no. Let me let me read to say Dominic too, because just a yeah. lot of Underwood criticism. Yeah, yeah. This is the things that worry me about Brad. You can't make coaching mistakes like this, especially in the NCAA tournament. That's how teams like Northwestern Loyola beat you. No unforced errors. So go ahead, Derek. I mean, on the note of Northwestern, I mean they they beat Purdue who. Uh, in their home building the last few years, people have a lot of respect for that team. So they, they've beaten good teams. Like It's not like Illinois is a one-off of a team that just get gets upset by a team that's not going to be in the NCAA tournament mix or or whatnot. So, not, and not to excuse away what went wrong last night for Illinois, but I, do, I will Michigan. say <laughs> – Right, yeah, they're not Michigan. Uh, definitely not. Um, Minnesota in previous years. More frisky this year, though. Um, yeah. Probably should have gotten Wisconsin the other night. Uh, but I think that we can get caught up in some of the the in game decision making. But I, I do think that it's it has to be backed by obviously not saying that there's not preparation to where what you're choosing then to pivot to has been practiced, has been you know I think some of the reason why they maybe don't play zone. I'm not saying they should is because they don't practice it or full court press that people sometimes want to see more. They don't probably don't practice it a whole lot or so on and so forth. So I think that. With the five way, I think you got to practice having the communication of yes, we're in five way if it's forced, but if it's if they don't really force us into it, obviously we don't want to switch Goody onto Bowie. Or if we're playing drop, we probably shouldn't be ten feet off the ball screen when Matthew Nicholson hasn't even gotten out of his break. So those are things that you have to rep and practice. Then in the game, I mean, you can adjust it, but uh, that those kind of go hand in hand. And again, I. Only they would know kind of what was instructed in terms of all of that. I'm sure there's probably shared blame there in terms of the players executing it, maybe the coaches in terms of finding the right solutions. But it's good to have these conversations in January and not after a March yeah. Madness defeat. And I got to be honest, I got, I'm glad Brad has kind of been more accountable with that stuff with us. Like after a game, he's right. like, yeah, that's my fault. That's my fault. Now, maybe it's protecting his player. That. Yeah. At the end of the day, like that, that is your responsibility. Make sure your players are prepared for this and that they can run it and that you can execute it. Um, it's a long season. I think sometimes we get caught up in like the let's have a grand takeaway or just the, the needle moves so far back and forth. Like we were on a podcast after Rutgers, we were arguing whether this team was going to beat uh, the IO Kofi team, whether they're going to run them oh off the floor. Gosh. And now it's like why we pushed back. Brad stinks as a coach. by so, so I'm not saying that they're the same group of people saying the same narratives. It's just right. 
it's a long season, and uh, Northwestern's good at home. I and you learn I, some yeah, stuff. I'm not running the sirens uh, after this. No, game. right. Um, uh, Brian, last one. Weird how the announcers were quiet for the first TSJ uh, free throw to basically amplify the chance. Listen, I, I heard Hummel getting some. Like Robbie Hummel's as good as it, as it gets. Uh, I guess he he's going to be opinionated though. He, he's opinionated about rules, and he didn't think it was a flagrant one uh, on Terrence Shannon. He got smacked in the face. Uh, so I thought it was a flagrant one, but I do not blame the announcers for getting quiet at that point because it is telling the story of the game. Yeah. Like if you can hear it at home, that's what we heard there. And and if anybody that was at the game, besides the awesome game, that was a huge part of what they're going to tell you about the game was those, those chants with the student section said. So I, I don't think that needs to be sanitized. If you're listening with your kid, I get it. Like, you, you can talk to him about it, but like, I don't blame the announcers for, for letting that scene kind of set itself. Like that was a game where you kind of give it air because boy, late in that second half, that, that atmosphere was phenomenal. And I'm a big fan of Welsh Ryan since they, they've renovated it. like that. That's a great atmosphere. And it always is when it's kind of half and half Illinois and Northwestern fans. We talked about it last night. It suits them. Like why have a, a bigger arena? Like if they were going to be in that sense, like, own the intimate environment. Know that you're not going to have 16,000 people. It's it's nice. It's Since they've renovated, it's a very nice arena. It's no longer like wooden bleachers like they had for a lot of years. Need more bathrooms. Need more yes. bathrooms. At oh, boy. They do need that. Yeah, we can offer those complaints up. But, yeah, I mean, the environment was fantastic. Getting the, the fan reaction. I mean, if, if they talked over the chance, there'd be people all over on Twitter saying, what are they saying? We can't hear it because – Robbie Hummel and won't won't shut up about something. So uh, they're they're and look, I haven't gone back and listened to it. I just I wouldn't tie it to like, oh, they should be hiding this or anything like. That. It's part of the story. It's part of the environment. It's part of what Illinois is up against the rest of the year. Whenever they go on the road, I if I was watching at home, I would want to know what it's like in the building. That's what that's part of what you're watching the game for. You're trying to get the best picture of what's going on, and that's obviously part of it, even though if it's, it's hard to, to stomach on some of the things. Derek, right before I let you go, I think uh, my, my, what it means is you missed an opportunity for a quad one win. They're now two, four, two and four in quad one games. You don't have many opportunities left. You got home against Purdue at Wisconsin, at Michigan state, at Ohio state, at Iowa. So you want to keep that quad two and quad three sheet clean. And you know, they'll probably have a loss in, in there at some point on one of those, but you want to start adding some of these, better wins if you want to get into that three seed conversation at some point no doubt about it yeah and we can talk about which we have rightfully so about how difficult it is to go into Walsh Ryan but on the the flip side like Illinois is supposed to be a pretty tough matchup for Northwestern because of their size because of uh offensively in particular now I know defensively was the the bigger issue last night but uh that's something that in terms of an opportunity I know if you would have beat them maybe I don't know how far they would have dropped. They were really right on the fringe of that quad one, quad two. So it wasn't – if you would have won that game, it would automatically would have been a quad one at the end of the night or end of the season, I should say, or even the end of the night particularly. But it, it is a missed chance to keep pace in the Big Ten race. I know now it's easier maybe to zoom out a little bit and say it's all – it's the bottom line is the seed in, in March and where this team's going to go, which I – I would agree with that. I would have said it regardless of what the Big Ten standing said. But uh, I, I do think that it was a missed opportunity. This team needs to win some some more some some games that carry a little more weight. I think to to then elevate themselves into a top notch type of tier. If you're talking top ten team, Final Four contender, shortlist, those type of things. They they've dropped some chances. Uh, you know, Marquette game, Tennessee game. Uh, this one that would have been ones that kind of prop you up a little bit more and put you in that realm to stay. Now I'm imagining they fall out of the top 10, but uh, still a lot of basketball. Terrence is going to get back to a level. I'd be surprised if we don't see him in dominant form, obviously within a few weeks, uh, but they are going to be up against it in terms of the spotlight, the criticism and some, some really tough reactions from fan bases, which it just is inevitable.
Yeah, that is their uh, life moving forward. All right, we will be at the Indiana game, State Farm Center, 2 o'clock uh, on Saturday. Derek Piper, thank you as always, man. Thanks to all the people watching live on our live YouTube channel. Hit the like button on your way out. Subscribe to us. Hit that notifications bell. We appreciate all you guys for tuning in. Uh, thank you to everybody listening on the podcast, audio only. Uh, give us a follow, rating, review, wherever you get your podcast. We'll have much more coming up at Illini Inquirer. But everybody have a great day. Take care of each other. We'll talk to you next time right here on the Online Choir Podcast.